To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for the care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally welcome and thank everyone for joining our presentation today. Our speakers this afternoon are Dr. Katie Clow, Ms. Camille Giu, and Dr. Patrick Layton, who will be co-presenting on the Canadian Lyme Sentinel Network, results from new surveillance initiative tracking tick-borne disease risk across Canada. Dr. Clow is an assistant professor in One Health in the Department of Population Medicine at the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph. Her research focuses on the ecology and epidemiology of vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. She also conducts research more broadly on One Health, including pedagogy and community level applications. Dr. Clow holds both a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree and PhD in pathobiology. She has worked in private small animal practice as well as at the national and international level in One Health through internships at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the Department of Food Safety, Zoonoses and Foodborne Disease at the World Health Organization and the Global Disease Detection Branch of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She regularly collaborates with public health professionals and veterinarians in private practice and industry. Camille graduated from the Edinburgh Medical School in 2016 after completing a Bachelor of Science in Zoology. She returned to Canada to undertake a PhD in Epidemiology at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Montreal, working on surveillance of Lyme disease. Whilst completing her PhD, she began a residency in public health and preventative medicine at the University of Sherbrooke. She is particularly interested in the surveillance of zoonoses using One Health approach. Dr. Patrick Layton is an associate professor at, of epidemiology and public health at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Montreal. He is also currently the director of the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network. His research focuses on the ecology and epidemiology of zoonic diseases with an emphasis on vector-borne diseases and the use of epidemiological models to predict future disease risk. Over the past decade, he has used surveillance and modeling to better understand the geographic spread of Lyme disease risks and the impact it has on climate warming on the emergence of tick-borne diseases in Canada. We will have Dr. Cloud, Camille, and Dr. Layton co-present, and then we will open for questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering them in the chat box or raising your hand using the icon, or if time allows, unmuting and asking your questions. Please help us welcome Dr. Clau Camille, soon to be Dr. Gio, and Dr. Layton to the podium. Everyone can see that? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I'll hand it over to Patrick, who's going to start. Thanks, Veronica, for that uh, warm introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm particularly happy to see a number of the, the participants in this coll collaborative Lyme Sentinel Network uh, here on this call, and uh, as you'll see, a, a huge effort across the country to pull together uh, the information that we'll present to you today. Um, Maybe we'll start with the next slide just to give you an outline of the presentation. So we'll start with just an introduction and background about this project and, and uh, tick surveillance in general. And then I will hand this off to Kemi, who has spent her PhD uh, building uh, and coordinating the Canadian Lyme Sentinel Network. And then uh, Katie, who has sort of taken on the leadership of this project um, who's going to talk about where we're at now and where we're planning on going into the future. All right, so just, just to situate us, so uh, most of you are familiar with the structure of the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network. Uh, it's split into in four different pillars, and the pillar in which uh, the, this Canadian Lyme Disease Surveillance Initiative has gone, is really under pillar two, prevention and risk reduction. The overall goal of the network is to improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of Lyme disease in Canada. And part of this is to sort of assess the 
the risk uh, geographically and over time uh, in different parts of the country. And so to do that, uh, we, we embarked uh, since 2019 on, on a surveillance initiative that's also tied to a number of research questions and hopefully generating data that will be useful in answering even more research questions um, that, that can be addressed by looking at what's happening on the ground. So let's move forward to the next slide. So just to provide a little background, um, for those of you less familiar, there's different types of surveillance that can be done for Lyme disease. Obviously there's surveillance of human cases through uh, medical clinics and hospital centers and emergency clinics and, uh, uh, and Lyme disease being a notifiable disease. So they're, 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 that's a type of surveillance that uh, we'll talk a little bit less about in this presentation because although ultimately we'd like to connect all these different data sets, uh, we've started with the surveillance of what's happening in the environment. So in this case, we have uh, active surveillance for ticks uh, Exodes scapularis ticks, Exodes pacificus in the west, and other other uh, ticks that um, that transmit uh, diseases um, across the country. And one way to detect these ticks and see whether they are present in a particular environment is through active surveillance. That is, putting uh, people out into the environment to look in a dedicated way for the presence of reproducing tick populations. Up and left, you can see the classic uh, drag sampling method where you pull a piece of white flannel cloth through the forest and then stop every once in a while and check for ticks and then collect those specimens. Uh, there are other forms of active surveillance, including rodent trapping and, and uh, other techniques where you're looking more specifically for certain stages of the tick. Um, but in essence, it involves going into the environment and searching for ticks and evidence of, of reproducing populations. I've put on the right uh, some results from active surveillance. One thing that's nice about active surveillance is you can go at very fine scale. And this is uh, within a park, a St. Bruno uh, National Park within in Quebec, where we've done quite a bit of research. And this is work from Ariane Zuma's PhD uh, thesis, where she tried to map the abundance of different uh, tick stages throughout the park to kind of get an idea of very fine scaled risk. I mean, this park is about two, two by, or yeah, two by two kilometers. Um, so here you can see areas where each of the different stages were detected uh, in different years and how in fact the concentrations of ticks changed over time and were not the same for each, each stage. So one thing you can do with active surveillance that's maybe different from other types of surveillance is you can really have a close look at the different stages of the ticks as well, which are not present in the environment at the same time or in the same densities. Um, next slide, please. So in contrast, we often have passive surveillance. So uh, it's not passive in that there's no effort required, but it's more uh, the effort in, in many cases, and this is really one of the great advantages of passive surveillance, is very much citizen science oriented. So this is people who have gone out and uh, been active in their backyards or, or walking, hiking trails, uh, who are submitting ticks for identification and testing in some cases, or uh, veterinary clinics that are submitting ticks on companion animals. And the results are a very large number of specimens. And that's wonderful because you can get a, a, a more comprehensive portrait of where ticks are being submitted. And um, uh, here's some, a, a recent publication. I see uh, Christy Wilson is on the line uh, as well. That's, that, that just came uh, out in CCDR where uh, uh, the public health agency team was able to put together different data sources and, and start mapping out some of these different types of, uh, of uh, surveillance data across Canada. And this is the one showing the ticks that have tested positive for Braley burgdorferi through passive surveillance, the total number of ticks being much larger, but here are the ones that are coming back positive. So as you can see uh, in 2019 alone, you have a very large sample and are able to do quite a bit of interesting mapping with this, this type of information. Uh, ETIC and their other, other similar uh, programs 
are another type of passive surveillance where in this case you have uh, photographs of ticks that are being submitted and you can't really see the numbers here but I mean thousands of photographs and this program is ra ramping up across Canada and there are other similar initiatives to this that give us a portrait of what people are being exposed to on an everyday basis in their backyards and in, in parks this is very valuable information um, for for understanding where risk is next slide please One of the challenges of, of, uh, of passive and active surveillance is that they operate on quite different scales, uh, often uh, in, in space and time, and they don't necessarily give you the same type of information. And so when we want to create risk maps, uh, it's important to be able to integrate this, this information in meaningful ways. Uh, one of the initiatives early on was to try and look at how many ticks were being submitted in past surveillance and compare that to sites where we knew there were, there were, uh, um, there were uh, established tick populations uh, in active surveillance and find sort of an equivalency, an indicator number of the number of tick submissions that, that, that were associated with, um, with the presence of um, an established population. That was quite useful because then it allows you to translate the passive surveillance into, into a measure of establishment, which is quite important. Um, early on, you have ticks that are being found, but that aren't necessarily coming from established populations. They could have been carried in by migratory birds and end up in the environment. Um, so this, this type of approach has led to a number of, of, of ways of bringing together different surveillance data sources to produce me meaningful risk maps. Uh, the one on the left is the uh, Quebec uh, Institute of Public Health uh, annual risk map. It's an interactive map where you can click on a municipality and get more information. And uh, this is, I like this map because it really shows both the richness and the complexity of combining these data sources. Here they've taken human case data, uh, passive surveillance data, active surveillance data, and uh, are looking at ways to integrate other types of data sources to come up with an algorithm that allows you to identify municipality by municipality, whether there's a significant risk, those are the orange zones, a present risk, so we know that there are some tick populations, but it's not at the highest risk level, and then a possible risk because you might find some ticks, but there doesn't seem to be an evidence of establishment yet uh, in these areas. And so this is a, a type of map that can be updated annually as new information comes in, but it requires a way to uh, merge this information on a scale that is going to be meaningful for you know both fine scale things like looking at you know within within a, a municipality and then and then broad scale issues like which region administrative region is at at now at a significant level of risk so depending on the objectives of the surveillance program or system you might have different maps or different types of uh of aggregation of data um, that's necessary and there is a challenge because you can't be everywhere doing everything. There are gaps in, in, in this map that are due to the fact that we just haven't been able to get into the field or there aren't enough people submitting ticks for us to get a meaningful signal. And so uh, all, any, any approach is gonna be imperfect, but combining them in many ways is, uh, is, is adva advantageous. And taking this kind of one step further, uh, here's a, a a map that was produced by Catherine Bouchard and colleagues, um, where uh, they combine both human behaviors and, and the actual presence and abundance of ticks in the environment to produce a, what they've called a social behavioral ecological vulnerability index. It's a, a mouthful, but the idea is it's not just risk isn't just about where the ticks are. It's about where the ticks are combined with how well prepared people are to deal with that threat. And so, you know, do we need to prioritize areas where people's knowledge and attitudes and practices are, are uh, sort of not not necessarily adequate with respect to uh, the risk that they're being exposed to. And so I think risk mapping has, has taken a step forward as well to start to integrate the human behavioral component. And this is really a uh, very interesting work. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, back up one. There we go. So uh, this leads us to, well, what kind of surveillance do we need? So if we want to track the emerging risk of, of Lyme disease across Canada, what should we be doing? We have all these options and different approaches. And uh, fortunately, uh, somebody took time to think about this, and that's uh, our own Katie Clow here, who, who uh, during her PhD came up with this adaptive surveillance framework, trying to identify, in different, depending on the stage of emergence, what types of um, surveillance approaches would be the most useful uh, or cost effective in some cases uh, at different stages. So we have the pre-emergent stage where you don't have established tick populations yet, but you're trying to detect newly introduced ticks or, or, or pathogens in an area. You have the emergent stage where there are populations are starting to establish and you have repro reproduction locally, and then local risk is starting to increase in some areas. And then you have the endemic situation where, where really, both the tick, ticks and their pathogens are, are very well established. And you're trying to understand how the variation in exposure is related to the, the abundance or the density of infected ticks in the environment. And then maybe bringing in other levels, human, human behavior and the, the application or not of public health uh, preventive control me measures. So if you look down under the approaches to consider, and, you know this sort of shows uh, an idea of the the most the usefulness and the longevity of different types of approaches across this this spectrum emergence, and we can see uh, cases of situations that are in each of these different epidemiological contexts across Canada right now. We have many areas that are under, are under pre-emergence, um, particularly the prairie the prairie provinces and and. Um, other northern regions where the conditions haven't been particularly suitable for uh, tick-borne disease, although the, some ticks such as derm center variabilis are very abundant in these areas and have, have their own associated pathogens. Um, we have emergent scenarios where we're starting to get more and more ticks. And, uh, and then we have areas that are highly endemic such as uh, parts of Nova Scotia and Ontario and Quebec. Um, and uh, even British Columbia pockets of, of areas of higher risk. And so how do we come up with a strategy that's going to sort of satisfy all of these different needs if we're gonna do it over time? So provincially or, or regionally, uh, obviously you can cycle through these different things. Maybe you start with passive tick surveillance and then you move to active tick surveillance in targeted areas. And this is what we've done in Quebec over the last 10 years. Um, and are still doing both, uh, starting to look at other ecological uh, alternative hosts, and uh, and then obviously carrying on with human surveillance all the way through. But you know, once, once emergence is clear, it's not very useful when there aren't any human cases. But once there start to be human cases, then it becomes a very valuable uh, surveillance tool. Um, but one thing that has that you know when we think about it that has value from the pre-emergence, even in areas where you don't already have established populations all the way through to the endemic where you know there are lots, but there's so many that, that you know, getting ticks, uh, all the ticks tested through passive surveillance just becomes a huge burden on, on whatever surveillance system you have. Being able to target sites to do active tick surveillance and then compare over time how things are changing is something that's useful basically from the beginning all the way through to the end. And this is what we call sentinel surveillance. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. The advantages of sentinel surveillance is that you're not trying to do it everywhere. You're picking out a number of sites that are, are useful or, or relevant um, for specific reasons, maybe geographic representativity, maybe they're close to human um, population centers, maybe uh, they're areas of particularly high high uh, ecological value in terms of being able to detect ticks. And then you, you survey those intensively and over time so that you can sort of see a portrait of how things are changing year to year. By going back to the same locations at the same time, you can compare among years and it reduces the total number of sites that you have to uh, keep track of because you've targeted them to begin with based on criteria that allow you to really orient towards the research questions or the surveillance objectives. And this is just an example of uh, work by uh, Camille Guillaume here for her PhD where she looked first within Quebec and over the past five, six years, we have 
we piloted a project in Quebec in collaboration with the NSPQ, Quebec Public Health Institute, um, and the Ministry of Health, where we set up uh, a number of sentinel sites that, in, uh, in, it's about 20 that we're monitoring over time over a five year period. And then from there, we tried to use that information over time to uh, see how well it predicted or it represented the risk in terms of human Lyme disease cases over five years. And you can see the resulting map and the match is actually remarkable for only having surveyed 20 sites over time. Uh, we're actually able to represent the zones of risk and how they've changed between years in, in a way that is, uh, is you know, uh, adequate for many of the, the public health or surveillance objectives. Obviously, we'd like to have information everywhere, but if you're looking for a compromise, this seems to be a pretty good approach. And this is really what has motivated uh, the, the development of a Pan-Canadian Sentinel Surveillance Network, which is uh, the subject of today's talk and was initiated in 2019 to try and get a standardized, repeatable surveillance uh, system that, that would allow us to track the changes in Lyme disease risk across all Canadian provinces over time with climate change and other things that we know are gonna to come to change, including looking at places where we don't have a strong signal now and including to continue surveillance in areas have a very strong signal like Lunenburg or Kingston and some of these hotspots, um, which with other surveillance approaches, you're just getting so many ticks that it would be unmanageable. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Camille to talk about build, the building of this network and then to present some of the early results. Perfect, so thank you. Um, so as Patrick mentioned for uh, the Canadian Sentinel Surveillance Network, we opted for the Sentinel approach, which would make it feasible um, in terms of you know, selecting a, a select subset of key scientific areas of interest and just following them through time, permitting us to uh, have an epidemiological portrait of Lyme disease through space and through time, really having comparable measures. Um, and essentially what it is, the structure is that we opted for sentinel nodes. They are sentinel regions um, that we go back to. So we want at least one sentinel region per province. So it's generally centered around a larger urban center. And within these um, sentinel regions, we have uh, individual sampling sites. So they're sampling transects where we go back every single year, they, they stay the same and that allows for comparability. Um, and we're aiming roughly between, so we have uh, you know, up to 15 sentinel sites, but generally we're, we're looking at, at five sentinel sites. And it's where, as Patrick described earlier, we go um, drag sampling, so with a piece of white flannel. And what that permits us to do is calculate a density of, um, of ticks. So we know the sampling effort, we know what distance we've sampled, um, and then yet yeah, we can calculate the, the density. Uh, so as mentioned, we started in 2019. Um, it was the first summer, so it was what we consider our pilot year, where we had to you know, uh, go out, uh, find our collaborators, establish the sites, establish the sentinel regions. We wanted to establish you know, feasibility. Um, then in 2020, so unfortunately, we had to suspend sampling activities, and it was really due to pandemic constraints. So a lot of our samplers are either, you know, from public health authorities or universities, um, and they had, you know, uh, constraints not, not to go out, uh, kind of isolation constraints. Um, and also some parks, uh, you know, were, were closed uh, in response to the pandemic. So activities were taken up again in 2021. So the, the summer's just passed. Um, and we'll present to you the, the results for 2019 and 2021, just a little bit later on. Um, and for 2021, we actually wanted to expand. So we did maximize our sites and we're uh, looking forward to expand in 2022. And that's kind of uh, Katie's bit uh, she'll, she'll explain to you. We can go over to the next slide. So essentially, when we built the Sentinel network, one of the main, um, you know, our, our main concern was how do we pick these Sentinel regions? So we knew we wanted to have at least one Sentinel region per province, so that you know, in terms of distributing effort, we'd at least have a little bit of look per, um, you know, for for everyone, uh, for every province. 
Um, but it was just, you know, deciding which sentinel region precisely we wanted to, to sample, because obviously we have a huge, huge, huge territory, um, and we wanted to try to make it as objective as possible. So how we did this is we use a multi-criteria decision analysis. And what that is, is really to solve complex problems. So here we have a complex problem in terms of Lyme disease has, you know, a very complex life cycle. It requires uh, you know, the right ecosystem, but we also need the kind of take human interface for, um, for, uh, for the, the disease transmission to occur. And then put on top of that, we did want a sustainable surveillance system. So we do have to take into consideration logistics of it. So with this complex problem, we have to break it down into uh, what, what we're talking about, a certain criteria. So the criteria that will impact our decision making. And that's really done uh, through the collaboration. So it's quite tight collaboration with the decision makers. We wanted to involve partners from across the different provinces because they might have you know, different priorities. They might have different realities um, just in terms of, of their context. Um, and then finally, uh, the last uh, element that we need is the alternatives. So you know, where can we sample? And in this, uh, uh, in this analysis, what we wanted was really the, the south of Canada. So that was all our alternative. It was a very, very large space. So once we have all of this, so the criteria, we can attribute weight to each of the criteria. We might decide that some criteria are more important than others. For example, we want to prioritize areas with a higher risk more than, let's say, the logistical criteria. So again, that's involving the decision makers. So we attribute weight together. And then with all this information, we can feed, essentially, we, we build this matrix where we can apply the multi-criteria decision analysis. And what that happens is that we get what is called a fee value. So it's essentially a ranking of all our possible alternatives. And according to our MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis, how they would rank out. Um, so we can go over to the next slide. And what was interesting and what we did is obviously because we, what we want is a sample in space. So we were able to uh, you know, use a spatial component to the MCDA. And essentially to do this is that once we elaborated criteria, so roughly in this case, to give you an idea, so we wanted, you know, we wanted to target areas with a higher population, uh, areas with higher, um, higher risk and also ecologically suitable um, uh, habitat, well, we can translate each of these criteria into geo-reference layers, um, and then we pile them up on top of each other, and we can run the, the analysis on, um, on this, and this overcomes kind of arbitrary um, uh, problems linked to, to boundaries, for example, um, and also in terms of visually, it's, it's much easier to present. So once we have built this kind of matrix on top of each other, we can create, uh, we run the algorithm and then we get the, the fee value. So the outcome is the fee values, which again, we can uh, put back into a, a map. So if we go to the next slide. Um, per, oh, perfect. Um, I'll just, I've got this slide here. Okay, so this is the map that we get. So this is the fee value. So where you see the kind of a bright area, so bright yellow areas, that's what the algorithm would say are priority regions. And where the lower uh, fee value, so kind of the deep purple, that's um, yeah, low, lower priority. And what's important about this map, because uh, we must have people from different provinces, so it's really done at the provincial level. So for example, Ontario within itself, the colors are comparable. However, I can't compare Ontario with Saskatchewan. They're really to find the optimal sentinel regions between provinces. And we, we knew how, you know, that we wanted at least one per province. So um, that, that's why we did it this way. Um, and then the other important um, thing to, to take into account is that the, this does not provide necessarily like a final answer. This is really to support decision making. It's to um, get you know, decision makers to know why one area might be uh, better than the other. We can uh, change the, the weight of the criteria. So for example, if I have an ecological criteria, I can assign it more weight and then I can see how the priority changes and how maybe one zone becomes higher than the other and then make my final decision based on this. 
So we can go into the next slide. So now if we go into results, so this uh, will start with 2019, as I mentioned, it was the pilot year. Um, so we managed to do 14 Sentinel regions. So we had a lot of collaborators um, and we did a total of 96 sites. And as you can see there, yeah, at least one, uh, one Sentinel region per province, um, except in, um, so in Quebec, we had three and in Ontario also three. So we have the Ottawa Gatineau site, which is kind of a trans-provincial site. Um, and we're quite fortunate in those provinces. We have a, we have a bit more resources um, in those provinces, which permit us to do more active surveillance. And also it's, it's all, uh, a, a hotspot for uh, Lyme disease risk. And also we have quite a concentration of, uh, of population density there. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So these are the results. Um, so number of ticks. So for 2019, really, really, really focused on the main vectors of Lyme disease. So it's all the exodies uh, species ticks. Um, so we found a total of uh, almost, you know, um, well, over 550 specimens. So the majority of them, so 550 were exodies capillaris. So they're found in, uh, in the east of the country. Um, whereas in BC, we found, um, Pacificus and Angustus. So. Uh, next slide. Yeah, perfect. And then these are the results. Actually, we we published in the we, we published a um, a surveillance report. So it was all the the partners together, um, you know, to to demonstrate what had been done in the first year. And I'll just take a minute to to explain this map. Uh, so this really is just the exodus species six. Um, so we can see all the sentinel regions on the map. Um, and from each sentinel region um, where exodus uh, was found, so not only scapularis, but we have Pacificus angustus in Vancouver as well. Um, there is a pie chart to illustrate. So the different colors are the different stages that we have found. So larvae uh, is yellow. So we can see it was in Montreal and Granby where we found them. Nymphs are red. So again, kind of found them a little bit uh, in most places, but more towards the east at, at this time. And then the adults are in blue. And now the size of the sentinel, uh, of the pie chart, sorry, is dependent on density. So uh, areas where we found more ticks, so um, yeah, like higher density of ticks are slightly bigger compared to uh, where they're smaller is because we found less ticks. So for example, in Lunenburg, which is quite big, you can tell that there were more, there was a higher density of ticks compared to, to Charlottetown. Um, and here I'd like to mention as well, so in 2019, so our idea is obviously if you know the, the life cycle of ticks is that it's very cyclical. So there's a certain phenology. So for example, um, the you know adults might come either in the, uh, in the springtime or a bit later in the autumn. Um, so the timing of it is quite crucial to make the, the measures comparable. So as a, a, a network, we try to uh, go out to sample at peak nymphal time. Why nymphs? Uh, uh, essentially because they are able to transmit uh, Borrelia, unlike let's say larvae that aren't, you know, we, there, there isn't any uh, vertical transmission. Um, and also they're quite small. So let's say compared with adults. So if you do a body check, you have a higher chance of finding adult uh, compared to a nymph. And nymph come out, you know, when, when people are very active outside. So although we try, so this peak nymphal time, if you think, you know, we have quite different temperatures across uh, the country. So it's slightly different um, in, you know, in different provinces. So we tried to, to target, you know, the uh, the time respective to the province. In 2019, I think we did generally a good job, but sometimes it, it's not exactly the same time. So for example, in Montreal and Granby, we went a bit more in August. So sometimes the proportion are not, you know, 100% representative. So just keep that in mind. We can go over to the next slide. Uh, so I'll go over this briefly. Um, uh, it, again, this is published. Um, so, so you can find it in CCDR if you want to have a bit more of an in-depth look. This is just looking at the infection prevalence. Um, so we, we have a general color code. So green, you know, when there was 
you know, zero percent, and then yellow higher, and, and red is is quite high. Um, and essentially, what we test for, so it's tested at the National uh, Microbiology uh, Laboratory. So there is uh, we test for Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the you know the main aim of our um, of the surveillance network. But we also test for uh, uh, Babesia species and the plasma. Um, uh, Borrelia, uh, Miyamotoi, and Powassan virus as well. So looking briefly, we can see that in uh, uh, so Kingston, Ottawa, Montreal, Granby in Quebec, uh, St. John's and Lunenburg. So where we tend to have a higher density of nymph, we also see a higher prevalence of, um, uh, of uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so now, as I mentioned, so 2020, we took a break uh, from uh, sampling, and then 2021, we came back, we extended, so we went from uh, uh, 14 sentinel regions to 18, and we bumped up our sites to 116. So general changes were an additional um, sentinel regions um, added, uh, and then there was also just um, Sentinel region red redefinition. So just to point out that Sherbrooke, so we had in uh, kind of the east of Quebec, there was Montreal, uh, Granby, and Sherbrooke, but we combined Sherbrooke and Granby together because they were just so close. So um, that was a slight change. And then in the maritime regions, if you notice, we don't have a site in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador or uh, PAI. And that's mostly again, so 2021, there were still some constraints. Uh, traveling to to these more remote regions, so the maritime regions, and we didn't have a team there at that point, so that that's why it's not included. And next slide. Okay, and then another big change in 2021 is that as a as a research network, we uh, as a surveillance network, sorry, we decided that although we we were still aiming specifically for exodies, you know, our main our main focus is exodies species, is that we're going out on the field anyways, um, and we're collecting other species of ticks. So we just put in place, you know, a very um, like a standardized way of documenting the other ticks that we have. So uh, in 2021, we had over a thousand specimens. So remember, we did increase the number of sites as well. Um, so we had, uh, apart from Exodes, there was the Haemophysalis leperiparus uh, uh, so 210. A lot of these are larvae, so they tend to, uh, numbers go up very quickly. Um, that's the rabbit tick. Uh, and also Dermacenter, so Variabilis and Endersoni. Um, in terms of Exodes capillaris, so we're almost reaching uh, 600 specimens. And then again in BC, um, as in 2019, we found Exodes specificus and Gustus, but there was also uh, two other species that we have found very small numbers. So it was uh, Aritulus and uh, Sculptus. Next slide. Okay, so we've, I've reproduced the, the same map uh, for 2021 as we've seen for 2019. Um, so again, so the colors are dependent on, on the stages that we found. So larvae yellow, nymph red, adult blue, and then the sizes depending on the on the densities found. Um, so if you look, maybe if you remember 2019, maybe we did, uh, it seemed like, you know, the, the proportion of all the stages are a bit more similar, let's say, uh, than in 2019. So we did try to uh, aim at that, you know, pink nympho period, then we were probably a little bit closer uh, to that. And again, we can see the densities um, are still higher, let's say more um, towards the east. So we have Lunenburg, St. John's and Sherbrooke in this case that are um, higher density of ticks. Next slide. So here, um, so we have, uh, we're presenting nymph density in this case, because as, as we mentioned, it tends to be associated with a higher risk to human populations. Um, so they're uh, again by uh, so so they're comparable because we've taken into account the sampling effort. So we have Lunenburg uh, that has a higher nymph density, followed by St. John's that's in New Brunswick, Kingston in Ontario, um, and Sherbrooke in Quebec. Um, and then you can see as follows: you know, there's Ottawa, uh, Victoria, Vancouver, Montreal, and uh, Winnipeg, with Hamilton having a, a quite a smaller nymph density. 
so we can go to the next slide where this is the comparison between 2019 and 2021. Um, so you can see uh, Lunenburg remained, you know, the, the province with the, uh, sorry, the Sentinel regions with higher density. Um, the bigger changes, let's say, are uh, Montreal, where it was, you know, very high in 2019 and then um, lower, let's say, in, um, in 2021, and Sherbrooke doing the kind of opposite uh, trend. And that's because some, depending how we how we redefine the Sentinel region, some of the sites that were over, um, you know, in Montreal, um, kind of changed over to to Sherbrooke because um, what, it, it, you know how, um, it, yeah, it was just site definition, so they're not, um, you know, uh, hundred percent comparable again. But it gives you an idea, you know, on uh, so tick densities have more or less uh, stayed stayed the same, but it's only a two, uh, you know, two year gap. So it'll be very interesting to keep, uh, keep this up in time. And then we can again, get comparable measures uh, through time. Next slide. Okay, so very quickly, just keeping uh, to, to leave Katie uh, time to, to talk as well. So these are uh, testing results from um, 2021. Uh, so again, just uh, there's different number of sites that we've done in different sampling efforts, but it's just to give you an overall uh, idea of what we found. So in uh, Victoria and Vancouver, um, there wasn't any uh, specimens positive, whereas Winnipeg, we did find one uh, Borrelia. Um, next is Hamilton, um, where there was no, uh, yeah, no positive found. Uh, Kingston, uh, Ooh, I can't see. So uh, 28 Borrelia uh, and also uh, for anaplasma. Um, and then Ottawa Gatineau. So we did find Borrelia anaplasma, the same kind of picture from Montreal. Um, and again, Sherbrooke. There was one found positive for Borrelia myamatoi. Um, St. John's in New Brunswick, we found uh, Borrelia anaplasma. And lastly, Nuremberg again, was the kind of Borrelia anaplasma picture. So that's a general overview of the results. And then we can talk about uh, next year, plans for next year. Great, thanks Patrick and Camille. And sorry about the, my, there seems to be a large delay in my mouse skipping forward. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm pleased to talk about um, moving forward as we really establish and, and continue to establish this network. Um, there's been a, a ton of work that's gone on in the past couple of years, and I think um, Camille, especially through her PhD, has really laid the foundation for this to keep going on. Um, and so this year we've really focused on formalizing uh, the structure and how everything can work really efficiently to get this um, network into sort of a well-oiled machine moving forward. Um, we have a tremendous effort from provincial partners that take care of all the regional coordination, so site selection, um, getting permits to access sites, and then doing all the data collection, which is um, a huge effort. And they also contribute expertise and are part of the networking, which is, is really what makes this, this whole network quite rich is that we know we have nodes across every province, but we can all meet together, we can share expertise, we can talk about different trends we're seeing, and really um, pool that expertise and build off the network as well, because uh, we continue to develop connections with anyone else doing work in sort of the tick and, and tick-borne disease world. With um, additional funding that um, has been secured through the Public Health Agency of Canada, we've been able to um, really establish more of the, the central part of the network, if, if that's the correct term. Um, I don't want this to be thought of as a hierarchy in any way, because it really is a network in, in where all the cogs need to move together um, and everybody plays a really critical role. But we've really endeavored in the next year moving forward to have some solid central support um, that can ensure that everything works really well and that our provincial partners um, are well supported to do the field work um, that is necessary to keep all of all of this data collection and risk assessment going. And so we 
as Camille has to finish her PhD, um, there will be a, a, a network lead uh, and coordinator that, that's coming on to take care of, of a lot of that national coordination work. So working with provincial partners, ensuring that there's routine um, and sufficient communication, I, again, helping with that networking and whether that's, um, you know, we have, uh, meetings nationally, but also making sure that there's opportunities for that expertise sharing um, and that knowledge sharing. Financial support is a big one. Obviously, our provincial partners are um, putting a lot of time and energy into this data collection and making sure that there is sufficient funds to keep this going long term. The, the national coordinator, we've also developed a protocol now moving forward um, for sample and data handling. So there's lots of samples coming in, um, how they're getting stored, collected, cataloged, um, being having all that data ready so that people can people in the network and beyond the network can access that data um, because essentially we're building this this beautiful longitudinal data set that can be used to answer a variety of research questions in addition to help with that risk monitoring. Um, and so building in the structures to support that um, moving forward are really critical. All of the testing happens um, at the national level and we've been really fortunate to have great support from the National Microbiology Lab that has been testing all of these samples to have ongoing monitoring in these areas. And then again, having a centralized place for reporting and additional expertise. And so we're working out this structure as we move forward so that you know this can, as I said, really function as a, a well-running machine over time that really enhances research um, on tick surveillance across the country. So uh, as Kimmy said, we, we were, we're gearing up for our 2022 field season. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of teams out um, within the next couple of weeks um, as we um, expand into or continue into the warmer weather where um, we see a lot of nymphal activity. Um, and through funding through um, the Canadian Lyme Disease Network through CIHR, as well as support from the Public, a Public Health Agency of Canada, this year we're really looking forward to doubling our effort. Oh, whoops, uh, doubling our effort um, from 2019. And so you'll see on this map that there's a, quite a lot of, um, there's many more sentinel regions. And this equates to about 200 sites across the country um, that we're, we're setting up to be monitored long-term. And as you can see, there's, there's good coverage across many of the Southern areas of of provinces. And there's a few on here that are, that are sort of wish lists that we don't, currently have the capacity to expand to, but we know that there's um, a need to, to continue to monitor in those areas. There's signals that are coming that, that it will be important for us to have long-term data on. And so um, the other really exciting addition is, as all of this is really run through provincial partners, is we have, we're securing provincial partners in both Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland so that um, those areas can also be surveyed as they, they weren't in, in 2021. And that will really help having the, the local effort so that there's a, a sustainable model in place so that things can be conducted year after year. And so again, we, we, as we think about moving forward, additional things that we're thinking about is, is making this really valuable for all of our provincial partners and how um, in addition to having the the sort of foundational data on the tick populations and the pathogen prevalence that helps with risk assessments and long-term monitoring is what other research efforts can we support through this network, um, through this field work and the samples that we have. Because um, as you can imagine, there the, the nature of ticks in this country and tick-borne diseases are, are changing rapidly with, with climate change and with land use changes and other sort of social ecological changes. And, and we need to make use of having this data and this, this long-term um, coordinated effort. And so we are um, establishing ways for sample access and data access. And then again, making sure that there's um, sufficient fund or, uh, funding and networking opportunities. And I see Veronica has turned her video on, so we're probably wrapping up. Um, but there's just one, I think I have one last slide to talk about. Um, and so again, we, we are constantly reflecting on how we can 
improve and build on this idea of sentinel surveillance so that we can really have a robust way um, of having that adaptive surveillance across the country. Um, and so certainly we know that there's inherent value for veterinary surveillance for ticks and tick-borne diseases as well. It's important, um, as you know, I'm a veterinarian, so it's important for, for veterinary risk assessment because many of these diseases also affect um, our, our companion animals. But there's strong evidence to support that um, ticks as well as serological seroconversion, so evidence of exposure to these um, tick-borne diseases um, that the dogs particularly can be a really good early warning signal for what might be coming for people. And so we've launched a pilot project in Ontario looking at that where we have participating clinics um, and we're looking both at sort of the data that's coming in. So the ticks and the serological data to think about how this might be effectively integrated into the national surveillance. And we're also looking at sort of the logistics, which again, when we're thinking about sustainability of a long-term network, um, how can we support veterinary professionals in this? Um, what is the best model that really um, helps us support this data collection long-term? And this is being led um, by a PhD student in my lab, Cyril Apo, um, and we're hoping to have the, the pilot project is still ongoing. We're in our second phase now. Um, so some of these results will be available um, within the next uh, six months to a year. Oh, I skipped ahead too far. Um, so with that, um, we welcome questions. I've seen a few come into the chat. Um, this is a list probably um, not exclusive because our list keeps growing, but we have so many provincial partners that make this possible. Um, and so this is a, a shout out to all of the, the work that has been made possible because of their efforts. Thank you so much, Dr. Clough, Dr. Leighton, Kami, for the engaging presentation. I'm going to move to the chat box and then we'll open up to see if anybody else uh, has any questions. There's a few coming through. Our first question um, is, I'll just read it off. Hot spots can cool off and cool spots heat up. Are you worried about doctors going back to diagnosing by postal codes? If we keep picking off the female spring, fall, spring, fall, you can succeed in wiping out a population. Is this a potential problem with your sampling technique? Ticks can, ticks can find us easier than we can find them. Can the maps lead to a false sense of security? Public health and PI tells people not to worry because we don't have deer. Are we at risk in Canada everywhere songbirds can fly? And I do know someone did provide a link from the PI health and wellness indicating there is still a risk encountering ticks in PI. So I do want to pass that over to the first question. Uh, do you want, I, I saw this question earlier, so I've had a little bit of time to think about a few things, but Patrick, I saw your hand go up, so feel free to, to jump in. Um, so I can't really speak about the, the diagnosis by postal code, but certainly, um, so one thing to note is in addition to all of the surveillance work that this network is doing with the, with the purpose of having this longitudinal data set in areas so that we can monitor trends, there still is different types of surveillance that's happening across the country. Local public health units um, will conduct their own surveillance. Um, human case surveillance is still ongoing. ETIC is ongoing. So this isn't, I, I just like to note that this isn't the only surveillance that's happening in Canada. Um, it's um, designed for sort of that long-term uh, look looking at trends, seeing what things are changing. Um, and so certainly there's, a com there's lots of combined data out there. Um, and because we, we can't go everywhere, right? Um, really the messages we want from the surveillance system is, is it provides us of trends across the country, um, but certainly, and so I hope that that clarifies a little bit about the, the diagnosis by postal code. Um, the, I, that's such a great question that you ask about potentially having sampling techniques wiping out a population. And um, I wish that was true. We've had thoughts like that before. Um, in the context of our sampling, so we sample for 
2000 meters um, along walking trails. And so we're not canvassing the entire environment. Um, we go once a year um, to monitor those trends. And so certainly um, the impact that we have on the tick population, especially in areas where it's quite high, is pretty negligible. And there's lots of other natural parts of the environment where the ticks still are and animals are moving in and out. And so, um, Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be successful in wiping out the population, but it's a really good consideration. And certainly if you are sampling an intensive area uh, day after day or week after week for years, um, you might be begin to worry if your sampling method could potentially have an impact on that population. Um, and, and the last question, I think um, it's important to think about, um, I see that that Dr. Badcock has, has put something about PEI. Um, we've really, over the last few years, changed our messaging a lot about even in areas where tick populations, there's no evidence of local reproduction, the risk is not non-zero. Um, there's still risk there. And you make up a, you put a good point there, Rob, about songbirds. Certainly ticks are introduced. Millions of ticks are introduced every year on migratory songbirds. And so, even where tick populations aren't thriving, there's still a risk that black-legged ticks can be in there because they've been introduced on birds and other mammals. Um, and, and certainly in areas where these birds are moving from really highly dense tick populations, um, that, that risk and that, that likelihood of introduction does, does increase quite a bit. Um, and Patrick, I don't know if you wanted to, to add on to my rambling or not. <laughs> No, that's great, Katie. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for that question. Our next question is, I work in Granby and Cowansville, and the density and tick ID percentages are very different from Sherbrook. I do not think you can combine data, or do you give a false impression that there is a problem in Sherbrook where, while the problem is really more important, and, and excuse my pronunciation in this French city, Montagerie is East? Um, I can go, um, and that's a really uh, good point, Raven. So essentially, I just like to bounce off what uh, what Kay was saying earlier, and um, it's really so the network uh, is really to keep uh, an outlook on trends. So yes, the trends from from year to year, um, and and that permits us so so we keep the sites, um, and obviously in terms of regions. Now, uh, the, so, so we have to define the regions and that's how we decided to, to define them. So we pick an urban center and attribute it that name. However, it, it's quite a large circle. So it's, you know, there can be like at least 15 kilometer difference between two sites. Um, and it's very accurate for, for uh, Sherbrooke region. So we know in Sherbrooke, you know, there's definitely less, less high density sticks compared to at Granby, Beaumont, etc. But it's not it's not just there that we can see that even you know in in other regions um, across. So so it's something that that we have to consider. Now when we present it, uh, we do attribute let's say the, the Sherbrooke region um, and through time. So it is comparable. So again, that it might not be fully attributed to Sherbrooke, but we can see from doing the same sites at the same time um, that that's how it is through time. Um, However, um, now keeping in mind that we've only done two years of surveillance, and then the first one was a pilot year, we're, we're hoping to extend, but kind of longer term objectives is really to have a, a finer grain of analysis amongst the Sentinel regions. And that's why we want to, you know, let's say in Sherbrooke, so we do have, let's say, which is an Estrie, more like a, a, well, we have a, the kind of West Estrie where, where it's the, the risk is higher. So we do have that gradient of risk, you know, so with time, we, we want to analyze it at a finer scale just to see how that risk evolves. But I think your comment's very relevant in the, in the sense that when we do public health messaging, maybe keep that in mind um, for, for those that, that read it. So thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, I may have missed this, but do any public health units themselves drag for ticks locally? In, in Ontario, I can comment on that. And yes, they do. And I saw Patrick um, had his hand up too. I was just going to mention that in re with response to 
the two questions that came up previously. Yes, they do in many places. And I think one thing you need to keep in mind is, first of all, this is all, this network is intended to be complementary to what's already going on. And it's not intended to be as fine scale as some of the other initiatives that are happening. For instance, I know in Saskatchewan, there's a, a big interest in the eastern portion of the province where the province is putting a lot of effort into trying to detect um, where there might be emerging areas. Um, which is perfectly complementary to what we're doing. And we're trying to work with, and in fact, we do some of the same sites and work with the same people to do it, but the objectives are different. And I think if uh, this comes to um, and Dr. Kelly's uh, um, question later on as well, is that there is quite a bit of variation at the fine scale, you know, between fragmented areas and, and even within a 50 kilometer radius, you're having high risk at one end and the other end of the emergent zone is still low risk, but that's gonna change over time as well. Um, so there, you know, this approach isn't adapted to looking at that fine scale variation. It's really to provide kind of a, a Canada wide snapshot that can, that can be repeated over time. But the, there is quite a bit of interest and effort going into looking at the finer scale variation. As I mentioned, you know, the, Quebec Institut National de Santé Publique is doing 100 plus active surveillance visits every year, specifically to try and get that finer scale detail in areas like Estrie and Montérégie to try and distinguish where there is emergent zone. So this isn't going to be the only information that's going to be available. And especially, I think the specific objectives of other fine scale surveillance programs will be better equipped to address certain questions about that that real difference in uh, tick densities that you're seeing um, among areas within some of these sentinel regions. Thank you. The next question is, do you wear any paramethrin treated footwear and clothing when you're collecting or in the tick environment? I can comment from our team. We don't because we don't like we're, we want the ticks to be near us and we don't want to um, repel them in any way, but we are 100% um, covered. So usually we look maybe slightly ridiculous when we're out in the woods. We have um, full white coveralls. We duct tape our pant legs and our arms. Um, students generally wear gloves and, and then full extensive tick checks on on the clothing we're wearing um, once those are removed and then full extensive tick checks um, following that. And fortunately, we've been really lucky in our field team to never have a tick on any of us because we're really, really um, careful in that regard because it's so important to keep our field team safe and fully, fully covered. Thank you. Our next question is, are you disappointed that there are so few visible warning signs out there letting the public know about ticks? For example, if you're driving through Nova Scotia, uh, or yeah, I think it says Nova, Nova Scotia, Western Zone, uh, you have no idea and that you could be potentially injured or killed from a bite of an infected tick. Uh, so, so I can answer this a bit. So um, obviously we try to limit traveling uh, for um, several reasons. So budget, you know, the environment in terms of wanting to, to keep uh, teams locally. So I can mostly speak for, for Quebec. Um, and uh, from, you know, when I go walking, we do have regions where, where there, there is sign, signposts. Um, and I think as well, so when we um, ask for Sentinel, for, for parks to be part of our Sentinel uh, network, we do, you know, it, it's kind of a long-term engagement. So we make sure that they're, uh, you know, they, they know of what we're doing and we keep them informed. And I have to say most of them, the people that I've interacted with are very um, curious, you know, and, and, and very interested in what we're doing. And there has been, you know, messaging to, to users. Uh, so from Quebec, I think, you know, from, so I've been doing it for a few years and I have noticed kind of increased um, awareness probably from, from parks, but I think it might depend from one, one province to another, but I think that's something as well that we can uh, move, move forward. So just thank you for, for bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, okay, the next comment question. Thanks for your great work. 
I see a lot of differences in tick density with regard to the type of habitat. It seems that fragmented, fragmatic natural areas are very much at risk. It would be interesting to document the change in density as environments are being fragmented for residential construction. Um, and I'm not sure if this next comment was related to that question or previously, but it does mention in Saskatchewan, uh, we work in Saskatchewan, we work with the health department to do active surveillance in regions where exodes has been found on passive surveillance. And then can we, yes, I see that you forgot to skip the acknowledgements for Saskatchewan. I'm just reading this. I'm very sorry. Which includes Martin Cordu, so Emily sorry. Jenkins, and Bill Curry. So to go back, I believe the question was around uh, interesting document the change in density um, as environments are being fragmented with fragmented with residential construction. I think uh, Patrick did comment on that a little bit about the the fine scale differences. I think. Certainly thinking about questions like that um, are really exciting to think about that, you know, over time, we're re revisiting these, these sites that we're at, we have ecological data and fine scale data that we can access. And with all of that information over time, we can look at some of these interesting biological phenomena that do happen. Um, and, and usually it does take, you know, a fairly decent longitudinal data set to be able to look at that because there are, you know, daily, weekly, seasonal, yearly fluctuations that happen in tick populations. And so to be able to kind of have a long-term data set and then look at different environmental changes and the relationship that they may have on, on tick density um, is another sort of important extension from some of the data that we're collecting. Thank you. Uh, that addresses all the questions in the chat box. We have time for one last question. If anybody has a question for our presenters before we wrap it up for today. Just looking to see if there's any hands going up. Going once, twice. Okay. I'm just going to stop your sharing, Katie, just so I can pop up my screen for a second. Okay. Again, thank you so much for attending today's presentation. I do want to say a special thanks to Dr. Cloud, Dr. Layton, and Cami for their engaging presentation and spending the extra time to address all our questions. I do want to remind everyone that our presentation series is continuing next week. We actually have four uh, presentations happening Monday through Thursday. Our next presentation is on Monday, May 16th at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We have Damian Bourne, who is a master's student presenting on the morphometric and genetic variation in exotic ticks at an expanding range edge. So hopefully you can join us on Monday. Um, also remind you that if you have a time, take part in our challenge, wear green or wear a green face mask, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness for Lyme disease. Uh, this month, if you don't like to send your own personal photos in and you are artistic, feel free to make a drawing or something creative and take a photo of it and send it in. All entries will be received will be automatically entered into a draw of one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. And our live draw will be happening on our last presentation on May 31st. And you can send your entries to gmail.com. Again, Thank you everybody for attending today and staying on the line. Everybody have a great day. It's Friday, TGIF. Everybody have a great weekend. Too bad it's not a long weekend, but it is still a weekend. Um, and uh, we hope to catch you next week as we continue our series. Again, thank you again, Dr. Cloud, Dr. Lighten, and Kami. And my apologies, it should be Dr. Dr. Gio, because you are medical school. I was, as I was thinking and reading it afterwards, I should have called you Dr. Gio. Oh, no, that's okay. I prefer to yes. me, so it's good. <laughs> I just saw the PhD student. So thank you again, everybody, and take care, and we'll chat soon. Thank you. Bye.